It's Monday 16th, June 2023, and you're watching Aim On Air, where specialising in connecting companies with its shareholders is what we do best. Hello and welcome back to Aim On Air. My name is Liam and today I'm pleased to be hosting Sean Day again from Greatland Gold. Welcome back to the show, Sean. Hi, Liam. Thanks for having me on Aim On Air again. I really appreciate it. Not a problem at all. This is part two of two um, and part one can be found at the top of the screen now if you've not seen it. Uh, these are different to our regular quarterly catch-ups. So we feel questions from shareholders that we are going to get through as best we can. For our icebreaker today, Sean, and this is a tough one, Matt says, it's the Ashes at home and you're down to your last batsman. You get to choose anyone from your lifetime. Who do you send up to save the Ashes and keep them in Australia? Anyone from lifetime as a number 11 batsman would have to be Gillespie, who hit a 200 and did a delightful text the last time an Australian batsman hit 200 and said, welcome to the club. Jason Gillespie. <laughs> Brilliant. I thought that might be a tough one, but you had an answer right right away for me. Uh, Sean, further exciting results have been released this morning with six drills intersecting more gold and copper in the Southeast Crescent. Could you explain those, please? Yeah, look, we're really delighted, Liam, with, the, with this updated announcement. I think what you're seeing is a continuation of more high-grade intercepts, particularly into that Southeast Crescent. But maybe what's you know what I most take away from this and what's most exciting is you're seeing that southeast crescent flow into that um, link zone and into that eastern brescia and I think what we're observing is that high grade following that pathway so that kind of circa four grade gram material through that link zone and actually through into that um, eastern brescia as well so it, it's really strong and, um, yeah, I think it's, it's starting to give us a, a, a new interpretation or a new understanding of the ore body, uh, which we're excited about and, it, um, and, and gives us a better understanding of, of where and how it's open at depth. Uh, the decline has advanced and passes 2,400 metres. Could you explain um, where we are in the process now, please, and, and how that's going compared to your planned approach? Yeah, Liam, um, we're, we're just on another um, spiral right now. And what we try to do with those spirals is we're tackling um, some more um, difficult ground, more softer ground, but all in keeping with our plan and, and understanding of, of the um, Haveron decline. So, yeah, it's progressing really well. And as we get through this spiral, then you'll see us come back out into another straight section where you'll see a, a real, uh, an acceleration again, but we take shorter cuts through these spirals just to manage the risk of um, softer ground and, and indeed the, the, the turn in the um, decline progress. So again, all these things are factored into and we're, we're really pleased with the progress we've made. And we're still on schedule to complete um, as expected. Yeah, I think we're very comfortable that we'll complete in that first half of 2024. And, and indeed, you know, I like to think, um, you know, we're running a little bit early on that um, schedule. So, but the guidance remains very clear on that first half of 2024. On the 1st of June, Newcrest um, announced, along with yourselves, that the jury joint venture management um, would change. What, what's happening there? Can you, can you elaborate on that for me, please? You know, look, as part of the jury joint venture, Newcrest had the right to become um, manager of that for, for some time, I'd, I'd say almost the last two years. Uh, they, I, I felt it was a great vote of confidence that they allowed us to continue to be the, the manager and, and also reflective of the relationship. I, I think the exploration team's working incredibly well together and we really respect um, their, their exploration team as well. Um, for whatever reason, you know, I guess there's been a little bit of movement both at the Newcrest end but also uh, at the Greatland end with us having, picking up you know, a really expansive um, footprint with the, the Rio Tinto transaction. And uh, look, we're kind of pleased, to be honest, that, that Newcrest wants to you know, increase their involvement and, and focus on jury. So... I think as we've as our times being a little bit more divided, I think if they can come in and focus and accelerate jury, that is uh, that is brilliant. 
And uh, am I right in saying that they need to spend uh, approximately 14 million to take the next level of earning venture? Yeah, correct. So the, that second part of the earning, um, I think, to take them to 70%. Uh, so look, that's a, a meaningful amount of expenditure and, uh, you know, we're delighted to see activity there. That's, that's brilliant. I look forward to seeing their, their dual program and, 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 and what they may find. A little quick clarification from me uh, to do with the Rio um, stuff. Um, Budgie Downs and Strickland, just wondering how deep is the cover and how far down do you think the targets are? Oh, look, the, across that area of the Patterson, um, you know, look, cover can be in some places as, as shallow as 20 metres and, and can kind of trend down to around 500 metres. Uh, so, look, it, it's it's not one size fits all, but, look, uh, those higher quality targets are, are typically, uh, you know, four, less than 400 metres under cover. And I, I'd, I'd kind of distinguish that from our Rudel target where I think we had an intercept at 800 metres. These are in uh, much shallower territory, which is part of the reasons why they... Uh, resonated to the top of the Rio Tinto work, why you can undertake better geophysical um, work or geophysics and, and lithochemistry. Uh, so all of these comes into why some of those targets are standouts for us. That, that makes sense. Thank you. Uh, regarding the bank funding, Adam has asked, could you explain the difference between the commitment letter and the letter of support on the bank funding? It, it just sounds uh, weaker and not stronger in terms of support versus commitment. Yeah, look, I, I think it's around fees, to, to, to be open with you. Yeah, I, I think if it's a commitment that's immediately drawable by us, um, then then basically we, we were at a point where we had to start paying the the upfront fees and, and what's called a ticking fee. Uh, the, you know, by contrast, we've actually been able to put it in stasis uh, and, you know, preserve that commitment. Oh, sorry, preserve the relationship, and and I think there were some quite strong statements around their commitment to our relationship and and us to them. Uh, but by the same token, we we are pushing back those fees. And again, I think our preference is to try to align drawdown with visibility on that um, definitive feasibility study. Uh, which again, my sense for it is it's it's, it's post the outcome of the new Crest Newmont transaction. Sean, I'm, I'm going to start with the, uh, the tougher of the questions, I'm afraid, first. Um, Simon, Martin and Conrad all follow the same theme. There's an undercurrent of ill feeling among some of the shareholders. And I can see why in some ways with the return of investment perhaps not living to some investors' expectations, even though, granted, others have suggested uh, numerous times that this is a medium to long-term investment, as you've always said. But with this being a name share, there's almost feeling directors must have what we term here as skin in the game. We've touched upon it in part one, and this is not the first time we've spoken about it here on Aim on Air. But I just wanted to clarify from yourself about what a closed period is, what sort of things can create a closed period. And I have no idea if you can even answer this, but given the opportunity, would you be adding to your holding? Yeah, thanks, uh, Liam and, and Simon for the question. Um, look, I, I think, you know, in so far as, you know, that was a, a commentary on the share price, look, these things are multifactorial. I think there's a, a general market situation in, in, in London and, and, you know, globally, which, which has impacted share prices, albeit we like to think we've done, taken a lot of really positive steps and we focus on what we can control. Now, in terms of uh, us buying stock, um, I, I've bought um, uh, you know, a, a reasonable amount of stock um, personally um, out, of, out of my own co cash for me, it's a, a meaningful position. I would anticipate that other directors are also seeking to buy at the next opportunity, which takes us to close periods. I think you'll find a great difference in, in governance over the last you know, 10 to 15 years has been a much greater focus on closed periods, insider information um, and market awareness. It actually is quite complex for management and directors to, to buy or sell stock. Uh, and for instance, we would seek nomad consent before we ever transacted on something like that. And, and you know, we would disclose everything we're, we're currently talking about. So 
for instance, I, I think you know, earlier in our discussions, we talked about those Rio Tinto transactions taking 12 months. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean you're closed for all of that 12 months, but it certainly does have a, an impact. So definitely, um, obviously, time will tell when we um, next have a window to do that. But, you know, particularly, um, you know, around now, it's, you know, it's a very compelling opportunity. So, yeah, I'm, I'm keen to add to my equity holding. And each time we've gone to market, I think people will observe I've taken that opportunity to add. But the equally, um, you know, I, I think waiting for clean air, we are trying to be really active. And that means, you know, it's always a little bit nuanced. So, yeah. Um, so that's why you see not just at Greatland, but across a lot of companies on exchanges and particularly the more mature exchanges. And I like to think the Greatland governance is really important to us. Andy says, uh, quite often when speaking to friends and family who know about my investment, I'm told I've made a silly mistake based on the price action. Do your friends and family understand what Greatland mean to you and the, and, and the potential it has to become by leaving a job that you transform the share price into one where the end cap is now three times smaller? Oh, look, I, I think my friends and family, you know, see you know, a huge amount of focus in me on this role. You know, this is not a 40 hour a week, you know, job for me. This is, this is it. Um, the, you know, people for, for however, people perceive it, I think they should have confidence I am all in on making this successful. The, so look, as I say, look, I, I really focus on what we can control. I'm really confident to talk about what we've achieved over the last two years and how we've transformed the company. And, and to be honest, I, I think, you know, one of the ways I've described what we've done over the last two years has been defensive in nature in terms of a platform that wasn't funded and had to be funded, otherwise it lost its prize asset. You know, this was an existential threat. Uh, so I like to think we've done, you know, a, a really, you know, admirable role in that. And I think we've created a structure that gives us a huge amount of options and potential into the future. And, and of course, I'd like to see that reflected in the share price. I, I think as we come closer to production, as the option value in our stock becomes more apparent, I'd really like to see that manifest in share price. But at the end of the day, I, you know, my focus is to achieve what I can control. And over time, I think the market price will reflect that. That's brilliant. Thank you. I, I suspect you must have just answered this question, but I'll run it to you anyway, because uh, it's a pretty good question as a follow up. Stuart says, hi, Sean, uh, you stated that Northern Star became a multi-billion company with an asset uh, not quite good, as good as Javier run. How confident are you in repeating this achievement with Greatland? Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Stuart. And, and, and as part of Andy's question beforehand, I, I think there was an implication about, you know, why did you leave Northern Star? And you know, the, these things are multifactorial, but, but Northern Star is a fantastic company and, you know, there is a, you know, there is a price to be paid at, at, at you know, trying to do something, you know, more on entrepreneurial. Um, but, you know, the attraction for me of Greatland was the quality of this asset. And, and when I spoke about the foundation asset of Northern Star, I was specifically talking about Paulson's and I, I don't think Bill Beeman, who, um, you know, when I was there was very much the, the CEO in the face of, of, of Northern Star, would mind me saying that Paulson's, which was tremendous for Northern Star, is, is not in the same um, league as, as, as Havron. But, it, you know, I think the attraction to me in joining uh, Greatland is the, the, that cornerstone asset that we have. Our flagship asset, I, you know, I have great belief in. Um, and... Look, I know it's not an exciting period as we spend three years uh, building the decline ramp down to that ore body, but we are two years into that journey and and successfully have, have progressed. So I think, you know, everyone's looking forward to the first gold pour and these things start to, to go from the far horizon to the near horizon. And I think that is perhaps as people, you know, build excitement again. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
Simon says, given the difficulties of the last two years, being the 5% NCM cooling publicly, uh, NEM arriving with the scene and, and the funding uh, moving around, has the job proved more or less challenging than you expected when you first arrived? Uh, let me let me be open on this. Much more challenging. Uh, I think, uh, you know, I I joined prior, sorry, I signed up to the company prior to the joint venture agreement being signed. I was somewhat anticipating I would have input into that, but it was signed before I joined. So that that was a little bit of a curveball for me, but um, equally I found it an incredibly rewarding experience. But this has been, you know, with reward has come the challenge of, of, of achievement. Thank you. Uh, we're going to move on towards Harry Aaron now um, and, and, and talk about that. Rob asks, if Telfer was to close, uh, what are the options for Greatland in managing Harry Aaron um, with 100% ore extraction and processing? Is Telfer the only real option or is Greatland considering alternatives? I guess that's in, in the event of however, uh, if Newmont do take it over, they decide they don't want it. In yeah, the look, there's, there's, well, look, just, just focusing on the processing element of that question, there are two ways to process um, uh, Havron ore. You know, one is through the existing infrastructure, uh, which is Telfer, and which is 45 kilometres down the road, uh, and an existing, I guess, relatively de-risked um, pathway for, for processing. An alternative um, is to build a new purpose-built plant um, right at the, the mine mouth, that does have certain advantages um, to it. It's a new piece of kit. It's right size for, for Havron. And you avoid haulage for years, if not more likely decades of material um, to Telford. So there is, depending on your size of the mine, the MPV is actually better to build a, a processing plant at the mine mouth. Uh, but you also have have to you know weigh that up with the time frame it would take to construct the the funding you need to do that construction and and the greater risk um of of actually undertaking a, a major project as opposed to taking advantage of existing infrastructure i think it's very likely that will continue the base case of taking advantage of that um existing infrastructure but world-class ore bodies you can solve in multiple ways and you know so we have the luxury of a choice there. But right now I would steer people towards what the PFS said, which is the base case is um, processing through Telfer. And you can close Telfer mining and still run the processing centre. Because they're two separate parts of their operation, aren't they? Um, Rob says, are, are there any other licensing concerns that could impact or delay the planned mining at Javier on being risks uh, that are being mitigated? Oh, look, the, as I think as people appreciate, the, the um, second phase EPA approval um, was um, accepted by the EPA for final determination. That builds on the existing EPA approval at Telfer. It builds on the existing EPA uh, approval at Havron and effectively joins those two operations together, again, which dovetails to the processing discussion. Uh, look, you know, we don't take that for granted. It's really important. Um, you know, Australia is an incredibly sophisticated uh, jurisdiction that highly prizes, um, you know, being good managers of assets and, and protecting environmental, social and cultural outcomes. We think Newcrest, you know, highly values those outcomes. We think if Newmont comes in, they highly value those outcomes. And so does Greatland. So we feel the the teams in place to to manage these outcomes uh, understand what's required and are committed to to managing these things as in best uh, as best practice. So you know, there's there's people can always imagine risk, but I think we mitigate that risk very well. In terms of the timeline, once the EPA comes through, which I believe is expected to be in the next couple of weeks. Once the EPA is stamped, is there anything else that we'd be waiting for from a government point of view in terms of being able to go mining? There, there was a very interesting presentation done by, I think, Roy Hill, which is a large iron ore mine in Australia, and they used to run, during all their presentations, every government um, permit and approval they had from local, state and federal government. It used to run 
like the credits after a movie down the side of their presentation. I I am misquoting this, but it was something like 3,000 separate approvals. As I said, the Australian and I suspect the UK and the US and Canada are all very similar. They are highly regulated you know, environments where we protect the environment, we protect social, we protect cultural, we protect um, these outcomes. And, you know, that comes with a certain level of uh, compliance, but we also recognise the value in that. So there's a, there's a, a, a never-ending list of, of things that are required, but I think in the general market, I think Western Australia is ranked number one globally on the Fraser Index for mining jurisdictions. So again, we recognise that's a risk. We recognise it's something that we have to put time, effort and energy into managing, but we also feel we have the team and importantly, Newcrest and, and, and or Newmont also have the team and the values to successfully navigate that. That's great. Thank you. Uh, Phil asks, could you please clarify what your categories, categories are for defining Javier on as a tier one? Because Newcrest are still categorising it as tier two. Oh, look, we to avoid this discussion, we typically try to um, phrase it as world class. Uh, the um, yeah, I think it's you know Newcrest having its own proprietary definition of what tier one means is is interesting, but we don't really need to get into discussion with Newcrest about what our definition of tier one is. So we we have tried to pivot although someone has pointed out the odd reference to tier one it has was was there was a residual reference on one of our slides because that's probably how we we think about it but we'll we're we're content with world class yeah, it certainly works for myself mike has asked newcrest holds a 70 percent joint venture interest in the javier on project but some of their documents are showing that newcrest currently has a registered interest of 40 percent in the javier on mining lease assuming this is correct could you clarify what it means for the greatland in terms of the jv costs and ownership yeah we we describe um the joint venture as being um 70 percent 30 percent that is beneficially correct uh, there is a process in Australia around lodging um, with the Department of Mines and 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 having titles updated and and a process around that. But um, I, I think, notwithstanding where Newcrest is in that process, I, I think for all intents and purposes, you know, shareholders should continue to understand that Newcrest has a, effective ownership of seventy percent of of Havron. That makes sense. Thank you. Tim asks, at what point in time will exploration drilling be able to start from underground as this will speed up and save money, presumably on further data on Javier and or body? Yeah, Tim, it's a great question. Um, I'm looking forward to, to getting to underground drilling. You know, in, increasingly, surface drilling is is ex expensive and, you know, people observe you just get a, a small, ever smaller number of intercepts um, because of the time it takes you to um, navigate down to where we want to test the ore body. So, I, I, you know, my expectation is what we'd like to do is get down into that country rock. So top of the ore body, um, then you'd um, set up a dedicated um, drill drive and then you do some underground um, drilling. And, and Tim's question is exactly right because you're right up sitting next to the drill body you can get some better angles better azimuths um cheaper drilling because it's shorter and the cycle time to get those drill intercepts is a lot shorter because you're drilling um shorter lengths and and just to add um on expiration drilling it's not linear the drill rig loses power and penetration um, speed as you get further away from the rig so the closer you are to it, it's a it's a virtuous feedback loop. So that is the future of exploration at Havron, um, Tim, and we're looking forward to getting there, but probably once we're at the top of the ore body. That's great. Thank you. Mike, thank you for your question. I'm going to simplify it, though, and ask what areas of the ore body do you think could be included in the next MRE? And I'm going to follow up with Rob's question of do you know the cutoff date would be for the next MRE, assuming that the August date stands for the Newcrest reporting? 
Yeah, and we're we're really focused on 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 that updated MRE. You know, we're we're happy to work with Newcrest on these things and be constructive. And I think before we've talked about, I think there are some technical reasons as we expand that Eastern Brescia, which might answer this question uh, from Mike. That you know, I think that Eastern Brescia is a, a real focus on on the next expiration update or sorry, resource update. But that southeast crescent continues to grow. But interpretation is really important in terms of how we feel. Um, you know, the the ore body moves at, at depth. So, uh, you know, I think you're going to see growth, especially in that eastern Brescia, which I think I've commented on before. Southeast crescent continues to give, and there has been some targeting of higher grade pods in that northern Brescia. So, I think you get a, a growth across the board, um, which is positive. But I think you know, I probably did them in sequence a little bit intentionally. I think it's led by that Eastern Brescia. Okay, thank you. We're going to move on to our own tenements now. Um, Michael has asked, if the first three or four drill holes at Pearl or A35 produce like Javier on successfully had five, would you change the strategy from precision drilling to pattern? And if so, how would you fund it? So... We'd certainly have, if we hit a uh, had five type result, we'd probably have a convoy of rigs um, coming out into the Patterson to accelerate the <laughs> drilling. So that would be a lovely thing to do. I'd like to think it's not necessarily pattern drilling. I think we'd continue to be um, engaging the considerable intellect of the exploration team to optimise that um, hole. But at some point, and depending on depth, you know, pattern drilling can be um, helpful. You know, particularly if it's more of an open pit type scenario, but normally that might be more of an infill than um, an initial understanding of boundaries um, and size of the price. But that aside, um, how would we fund it? Well, it'd be a lovely problem to have, uh, but you know, we also feel we have good access to capital in the market, and I think you know that another had five type result would resonate with the market as well, or at least it should. Yep. No, I, I understand that fully. Thank you. Stuart and Stephen are asking about the 2023 Scallywag program. Are you able to talk through the current plan of action? And as a follow up from me, did we see cause coming into the office on the proactive interview the other day? Um, okay, okay. So, um, the, so let me answer your in reverse order there. Look, I, I there was a delivery in the background that that was not poor. Um, oh. but such is the fun of running a, a reasonably small team and a, and a reasonably small office. Um, yeah, you know, the, the, the practicalities of deliveries happens in the background, but hopefully that wasn't distracting. Um, in terms of um, the Scallywag program, it continues. We, I think we've previously, um, you know, commented that the the team is active in the Patterson as we speak. There's a rig spinning. You know, we want to invest and and spend time on that um, A35 Pearl and other um, high value targets that we have in the Scallywag. But also, excitingly, we have the team there. We have a rig. We think we'll be able to get some Rio Tinto, uh, well, South Patterson, I might start calling it, South Patterson um, drilling done uh, this uh, this calendar year as well. Uh, because some of those targets um, and, and some high quality targets are already heritage cleared, already de defined drilling programs ready to go. We will spend some time refining it and making sure we agree and, and we will do that constructively with Rio. But I think you'll see some rig spinning there as well this year, which is super exciting. There are some targets on Rio Tinto that look more like Havron than Havron. It's yeah, it's a good place to drill. I'm looking forward to seeing uh, some of the imagery coming through as you start to release the data. Um, are you able to um, expand on how many drills you're hoping to sink this year? Oh, look, I, I think we have a, a you know, a, an initial program of. 10 maybe it's a dozen um holes that that we're um presently in our, our plan and that that may ebb or flow a bit because some of those holes can be contingent on um outcomes uh but also maybe there's some upside risk in that with the with the rio tinto tenements coming in before we did our um initial budget planning for this year that, that makes sense. Thank you. Uh, Stephen and Nick share a question on our Tasmanian assets. Um, Nick says, hi, Sean Liam. Thank you for taking questions. Do you have any news on the option for Fling Gold and the purchase of Fire Tower and Warrantina tenements, which expires in uh, a month's time? 
Yeah, look, um, if, if we, we started with some talking about closed periods, so look, I, I think what I have to say there is I can't comment on that um, presently. But look, we, you know, we really value the relationship with Flynn Gold. We think they're a good team and, you know, think they were a great selection um, for a partner in Tasmania. So, um, but I, I, you know, that, that continues to evolve and I'm, I, I am conscious it's a good question that that option comes to a conclusion at the end of this month. Okay, thank you. Uh, David is asking, considering today's farming announcement with Rio Tinto and with our emphasis firmly on the Patterson, are, slash would GGP, consider seeking JV exploration partners for Bromus and Panorama to accelerate those projects? Well, well we, we would. Um, I, and I think, but I think what I would add to that is the days, I like to think the days of Greatland sharing its best assets or you know, giving part of them away for another team to come in and manage are behind us. <laughs> so I, I, I think if we were madly in love with Bromus um, or, or, or Panorama, I think that would be very unlikely. I think if we felt they competed less well with our other opportunities in, um, in exploration and would otherwise struggle to attract capital, that's when we would bring in a partner. And, and look, the portfolio right now, with that Patterson, with the South Patterson and Giles, don't forget, he's really high quality. And again, um, you know, I, I like to think I've added to that now, but what I inherited there um, from Callum Baxter was absolutely outstanding and Havron is, you know, absolute evidence and testament to that. So, you know, we, we have a brilliant portfolio. Um, if there's an opportunity to upgrade it, we will. Um, but I, I would be hesitant to, to give away management or, or the intellectual control over our, tier, our best assets. That makes sense. Uh, Tim's got a question that uh, is going to be fun to watch you try and answer. With Rio Farming announcement, does that bring a close to Greatland's growth plans in the Patterson or are there other possible avenues in the planning stage? Yeah, Tim, look, we're, we still remain open to growth and, and think, you know, we strongly believe in the Patterson. We have great relationships with the mining companies there. We have great relationships with the um, Indigenous groups there. And, you know, we think we have a competitive advantage around our understanding of the Patterson. So, look, we remain open to, to growth opportunities. Thank you. Rob says, do you still believe this is a multi-billion company in the making with the current portfolio and significant management board? Look, with, without commenting on share price, it certainly is my ambition to transform this into a multi-billion, multi-asset um, platform. And I've been really fortunate in my career to be part of teams doing that across Strait, Sakari and, and Northern Star. Um, you know, I was C-suite within all those three groups and, and spent, you know, I like to think I contributed to that success, but also I really recognise that it was a group of us that delivered that um, success. And I like to think building the team we have gives ourselves the highest probability of achieving that ambition. It's a great ambition to have. Uh, Phil would like to know, please, What's the status of the canning licences? Yeah, look, um, I, I think they're in good good standing. Um, yeah, you know, and we continue to you know weigh up expiration within our portfolio, and some of those you know are grouped into tenement exp um, groupings so that you can spend on one and and uh, achieve your minimum spend a across that group. So we kind of manage it as a portfolio there in the um, in the Patterson. OK, thank you. Bamps is asking, uh, has the potential supergiant zinc find northwest of Ernest Giles enhanced your opinion of this licence? Uh, and uh, how are we going with the uh, plans there? Look, Ernest Giles doesn't need a lot to, to make it better, but, but yes, um, exploration um, success in that postcode is always welcome and, and nice to observe and understand if there's structures from that that we can learn from. And again, I, I have great confidence in our exploration team to try to decipher that and understand what opportunities that creates for us. The, you know, we continue to progress. 
you know, we'd, we'd love to, to be drilling um, and Styles this year. I haven't given up on that. You know, truth be said, with each passing month, the probability of that starts to slip away. But we have had meetings with the, the First Nations group um, this calendar year on it. Uh, we continue to progress those discussions. We respect their time frame. Uh, and I'm hopeful that's still achievable, uh, albeit you know, in June, I am slightly less conviction on that than I had in January, but you know, it's we will continue to strive to achieve that. Okay, thank you, Sean. Uh, Ivan is asking questions about the share price, which I know you're not comment on. So to help get his question answered, and this is actually your last question, could you kindly recap the key milestones for Greatland to production and beyond, please? Look, um... <sighs> Yeah. Okay. So, in terms of milestones from here, I, I think there's, I think we come into quite a rich catalyst of events. The the ASX listing in the short term, I'd I'd like to complete. The MRE update, I think, is really good. Um, we have the definitive feasibility study at some point. Uh, first, we we reach the top of the ore body. Uh, we set up the stopes, we have first ore, uh, we have first processing, first gold pour, and then at some point we're in free cash flow. So that's a pretty rich environment um, you know, over this period, um, and we're really excited about that process, and I think overlaying all of that um, is an exploration program uh, you know, which has the delivery, uh, the ability to deliver option value to our shareholders. Sorry, I'm sitting yeah. here smiling because that it just sounds rather exciting. Uh, thank you, Sean, and, and thanks for being a guest on our show. Uh, have you any last words for your shareholders today? Oh, look, just um, really, uh, you know, appreciate the support. And you know, one of the reasons I was keen to do this is I, I had anticipated being up in London and doing a town hall um, meeting uh, you know, at late May, early June. Uh, that's obviously pushed out a little bit. And I, I really just respect that people had questions and, and, and wanted the opportunity to ask those questions. And I think platforms like AIM On Air give me the opportunity to, to engage even when I can't be in London. So hopefully people appreciate that. Even if I can't be there, um, you know, it's really important to me to be respectful and engaging with that, um, uh, you know, that shareholder base up in London. So ho hopefully um, that comes across. No, it, it does. Thank you very much. And have you have you got in, any ideas on dates yet or are we just waiting until things are where you want them first? Oh, look, um, I the, the, the risk of me giving you a date is I have to change it again, but I, I think it's sure. now late June. But um, So hopefully people don't mind me anticipating what the date will be, but hopefully that won't um, change. But that last week in June is my hunch. Okay, thank you very much. Sadly, this is the end of the webcast, ladies and gents. If you want to reach out to us, you can contact us on Twitter with the address that's on the screen. And before you close this page, I would really be grateful with any thumbs ups. Until next time, my name is Liam, and you've been watching Aim on Air, where specialising in connecting companies with its shareholders is what we do best. Thank you. <laughs>